Anim Bijou again. So here we are continuing the story of two of the great migration stories that come on a turtle island. And I can't remember if I said this in my first lecture, but I'd like to emphasize that just because these are migration stories, I don't want you to keep in your head the idea that Native American people were nomadic people. Um, that's kind of a, a misconception and a stereotype that isn't founded. Nomadic societies are, are there's, there's a very definitive definition, very definitive characteristics that nomadic societies have. Uh, nomadic societies are not settled in one place at any time. They are based on following herds of animals that they are that they have domesticated or semi-domesticated or you know are dependent on in some way or other. They follow those herds of animals and while they may follow those herds of animals in a very large but you know um, habitual space, you know habitual regions could cover you know any number of miles, um, they don't settle down and they are constantly on the move. So the Maasai in Africa follow their cattle. That's something, that's who they, that's what defines their society is this following of the cattle herds. The Sami in Northern Europe follow the reindeer and that's what defines their traditional culture is this following of the reindeer. When we talk about migration stories, we're not talking about people who are being nomadic in that sense. We are talking about people, these are stories about people who have been settled in one place, um, but then for some reason or other make the decision to go on a vast uh, a journey to go to an entirely different location. In the case of the Anishinaabe, we're talking about leaving from the east coast of uh, Turtle Island along what we now call the Atlantic Ocean to where we are here in the North Woods, Anishinaabe King, the Great Lakes area, the Northern Great Lakes area. Um, that's the Anishinaabe migration story, but they didn't know that at the time. So the story goes um, with the Anishinaabe, and this is coming out of Eddie Benton Benet's, mostly coming out of Eddie Benton Benet's, the Mashomas book. A little tangent note here, his book, the Mashomas book, is an excellent collection of Anishinaabe stories and really done a great service, many people feel, um, in having these made available to people so that people can learn their culture and um, learn about the Anishinaabe, learn about the Ojibwe. However, these stories have always been told, right? Spoken. Um, and stories, many storytellers would say, traditional storytellers will tell you stories were meant to be told, and there's good reasons for that. So while when the stories are being told, there's always, uh, you know, certain elements of fact and detail that must be carried forward. There may be variations in some of the other aspects of the storytelling. So that some of these um, accounts may vary slightly from person to person. And some of you may have heard slightly different, slightly different versions. Um, but they all, they all describe the, the, the true essence of the story. The storytellers work very hard to be true to the essence of the stories. So the idea is the Anishinaabe were living a really wonderful life, a happy life, a full life, a peaceful life, on what is known as the Atlantic Ocean. And according to Thomas Peacock in his book, The Good Path, he says Anishinaabe, the Anishinaabe people lived for so long on the East Coast that many, it is said that many forgot that they ever had lived anywhere else. And he makes the argument that the Anishinaabe actually were part of the, or at least in part, were part of the Lenni Lenape um, and, and are connected to that migration story told in the Lenape's Wallam Olam. So the Anishinaabe were living there on the East Coast in, in a good life, living a good life. When these seven prophets came to them, and these seven prophets came with predict seven predictions for the future, these predictions were called fires, and each fire referred to an era in the future that the Anishinaabe would experience. So these predictions, these teachings for, for to the Anishinaabe are called the seven fires teachings or the seven fires predictions. So with each of these seven fires teachings, as they're called for in the Anishina with Anishinaabe people, um, there were specific predictions. The first prophet, talking of the first fire, told of how the Anishinaabe would rise up or many of them would rise up and come to follow the sacred mega shell. And the sacred mega shell would lead them to the land where the Anishinaabe belong. And as part of this journey, the Anishinaabe would rally around the Madewin Lodge, which is a, a major religious society within Anishinaabe culture. And the Madewin would become a source of great strength for the Anishinaabe. 
When the Anishinaabe were to go on this journey, they were to look both at the beginning and the end of their journey for the turtle-shaped island. And this turtle-shaped island, it is said, the prophet said, would be linked to the purification of the earth. They were to go to the land where food grows on water. Go to the land where the food grows on water. Those who chose not to leave, the prophet said, would sadly face destruction, not because they disobeyed the prophecy, but because that's what was coming in the future. The second prophet told of the time of the second fire. This would be when those Anishinaabe who had left and were on this journey to find the land where the Anishinaabe belonged, the land where the food grew on water, would come to a point in this long journey, which many people believe took several centuries, um, would come to a point on this journey when they would lose sight of the mega shell. They would lose sight of what they were traveling and journey, journeying for. And the Medellin Lodge would lose strength and people would become lost. They would start to lose their traditional ways. They would not know who they were as Anishinaabe people, essentially. So there would be some time where the people would spend in this sort of um, vacuum, this sort of era, era where they didn't really know what was the point, where, why were they on this journey anyway, who were, who were they as Anishinaabe people, they would lose their way. But this, this second prophet said a boy would be born and would point the way back to the traditional ways and he would show the Anishinaabe the direction to the path to the stepping stones that they needed um, that would lead the Anishinaabe into the future and to that land that they were seeking. The third prophet told of the third fire when the Anishinaabe would find that land where the food grows on water, the land to which they belonged. And part of these prophecies also talked about how there would be disagreement about exactly where this was. Um, so different, or they didn't talk about the disagreements. They talked there would be several different stopping points along the way. The second fire being one of those stopping points. But there also came to be when the Anishinaabe reached the area they thought was it, was the land the Anishinaabe belonged to, where the food grew on water, there was disagreements as to where that should be. Um, and as you can see here, some people, some Anishinaabe people stopped at what we call Manitoulin Island, some at Bawatain, what many people call Sault Ste. Marie today. Some um, stopped at the island of the golden-breasted woodpecker, referring to the flicker, um, what some people call Madeline Island today. And still a few others continue to head further west, and some people feel that the Cheyenne and such may actually be associated with the Anishinaabe. The fourth fire had two prophets. The two prophets came as one, the stories say. Two prophets came as one to speak about the fourth fire. Both of them talked about the coming of pale-skinned people. One of them said, these people may come wearing the face of friendship. And if these people come wearing the face of friendship, you will know if they come with no weapons and they carry only their knowledge and a handshake, those people are coming with the face of friendship. And if they come with the face of friendship, there's a beautiful future in store for both of the people, both, both, both peoples. There will be a, a, a beautiful time of sharing each other's cultures and um, merging together as two people into one mighty nation. And this prophet of the fourth fire said, when this happens, later these two people will be joined, the Anishinaabe and the people who come wearing the face of friendship, the pale-skinned people who come wearing the face of friendship. These two people, when they join together, will later be joined by two other people, and together all four of them will, two other peoples, I should say, together all four peoples will join together to create the mightiest nation of all. It was a really beautiful prediction of what could happen, of the possibilities that were there. There was, however, like I said, a second prophet that came with the fourth fire. And this prophet said, the pale skin strangers may come, or they will come, but they may also come wearing the face of death. If they come bearing weapons, beware. If they come and they are suffering, be leery, because though they are suffering now, in their heart they may carry greed for the riches of your land. And they said, it's really hard to tell sometimes between the face of brotherhood and the face of death. So don't let them fool you. Be very careful. If they are your brothers, let them prove it. Don't accept them with total trust. And that prophet told the people, there is one sure way you'll know if they come wearing that face of death. And that is, if the rivers turn to poison and the fish become unfit to eat, you will know that the pale skin strangers have come wearing that face of death. And that will usher in this time called the fifth fire, um, which we'll talk about in more detail later in another lecture, but essentially it's a time of the fifth and sixth fires are a time of great loss. And they eventually, however, 
are to be followed by the seventh fire when the Anishinaabe would have an opportunity, the chance to reclaim, and they would start to reclaim what they'd lost in the fifth and sixth fires um, if the fourth fire ended up having the pale skinned strangers come wearing the face of death. The seventh fire also has a choice that society at large, at large has to make that is either going to be about whether we destroy the earth as we know it or we continue into a beautiful future um, based on traditional ways of living and traditional ways of caring and respecting for the land in all our relations. So we'll talk about the fifth and sixth fires um, soon and the seventh fire much later on. But for now, I want to kind of end with that. You know, the Walam Olam with the Lenny Lenape I talked about in the last lecture, you know, their question, the only thing left, the Europeans had arrived. And the last thing in the Walam Olam is who are they? And for the Anishinaabe, those prophets of the fourth fire saying they will come wearing the face, either the face of the pale skin strangers will come wearing the face of friendship and a beautiful future is in store for you joining together, creating this mighty nation, two other peoples coming to join you, creating the mightiest nation of all, or come wearing the face of death. Um, the rivers will turn to poison, the fish be unfit to eat, and a long period of loss, tragedy, and destruction is going to follow. That's where we're at right now um, in terms of what we're taking a look at and what we're studying, and so I want to leave it there as heavy and sad as that is because that's that's the era we're entering into in, in our studies at this point in time. All right, um, I look forward to hearing what your thoughts are and any questions that you might have. All right, you guys take care. Bama P. See you later.